I want you to turn in your Bible now to the book of 1 Samuel, the Old Testament. I just feel to bring a bit of a word and I didn't want to bring this word. Um, I felt like I wanted to talk about Christmas, but God kept saying to me, I want you to talk about this. So I'd rather be obedient <laughs> than preach a word that he doesn't want me to preach. Okay, 1 Samuel chapter 3. Now this is a familiar passage of scripture to many of you and I'm just going to read it and we'll talk a little bit about it and I just really want to bring some, some thoughts out of this. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. And it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place when his eyes had begun to grow dim that he could not see. And before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel. And he answered, Here I am. So he ran to Eli and he said, Here I am, for you called me. And he said, I didn't call. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. And then the Lord said again, Samuel. So Samuel arose, went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called. He answered and says, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not, know yet, net, did not yet know the Lord, nor the word of the Lord was revealed to him. Now the Lord called Samuel again a third time, so he arose, went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down. And it shall be, if he calls you, you must say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went, lay down in his place, and the Lord came, and he stood and called his other time, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered and said, speak, for your servant is listening. And then the word of the Lord said, sorry, the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And down to verse 15 it says, So Samuel lay down until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He answered, Here I am. And he said, What is the word of the Lord? Please do not hide it from me. God, so do to you and more if you hide things from me. That's a pretty awful thing to say, isn't it? Then Samuel told him everything and then hid nothing from him and said, It is the Lord. Let him do as he seems, seems good to him. So Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words for, let none of his let none of his words fall to the ground, and all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed Himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Father, we thank you that your word is true. We thank you for the word of the Lord. And this morning we pray that you'd give this preacher the ability to speak about the word of the Lord in Jesus' name. Now Samuel was a promised child. For those of you who don't understand the story, it's a wonderful story. I love all the Old Testament stories because they're, I often say this, but they're type and they're shadow. In other words, God does something and he uses it as a picture of something he will do in the future. And this man was a, a prophetic fulfillment. His mother, her name was Hannah. And Hannah was the beloved a beloved wife but she was childless she had no children and she she was begging before the Lord and she made a vow before the Lord if you give me a child he will be dedicated to you now this man Eli was the priest in Israel and and he came up to Hannah and he thought she was drunk because she was so she was so affected emotionally by by this things she had in her heart. She needed to touch God. And um, he thought, he said, when are you going to give up drinking? He said, my my Lord, I am not drunk, but I, I am grieved in my spirit. And so finally, Eli prayed and he spoke a blessing over this woman and and finally, we find this, this woman gives birth to a son, and his name is Samuel. And this word Samuel, it means asked of God, heard by God. What a, great, what a great meaning that is. Asked of God, heard by God. 
And so, as promised, you placed him under this priest, Eli, and our story takes place. Here he, here he is, a little boy, and she brings him into the temple of God, and she, she makes an ephod, she makes the clothes for him, and she places him there, faithfully doing what she promised she would do. And this young man, Samuel, grew, and he started to clearly hear the voice of God. And he became one of the more significant prophets in the Old Testament. In fact, there's two books in the Old Testament, 1 and 2 Samuel, that uh, books that are, tell the story of this man's life and the, the things that happened around about him. But he was truly a, an interesting man. And it's interesting to me that this passage begins with the word of the Lord was rare in those days and there was no frequent vision. In fact, in your, your scriptures, it might say, and visions were rare. You know, in the Bible, it tells us without vision, people perish. Without an, un, without an ongoing revelation of God, the people of God perish. Friends, we need to hear God. Who knows that? We need to hear the heartbeat of the Father. We need to hear his voice in the midst of our life. And if we don't hear God, we end up getting led astray. That's true, isn't it? Who's been led astray before? No one wants to put their hand up for that. That's okay. But the word of the Lord was rare in those days and there was no frequent vision. And I want to talk this morning for a few moments about the voice of God, about how to hear the voice of God. You know, the Bible actually says that my sheep hear my voice. Turn to someone and say, bah. <laughs> bah. <laughs> you know, sheep are particularly stupid animals. Did you know that? Who's ever had a sheep? Who's ever, we, we pl plenty of sheep. Oh, I've got a couple. I'm not saying you're stupid. Okay, that's not what I meant. But it's really interesting to me that Jesus chose to align the whole picture of a sheep with his children. And the reason being that sheep are particularly needy animals. They have no natural defences. They have no claws. They're very frail. They're not able to hunt. They can't look after themselves. They can't even find their own way. And you know why he relates it to us? Because they need, or God wants us rather, to be a shepherd, or oh, I've said that all wrong, but he wants to be our shepherd. You know what I mean. You know, it's really interesting in his day, in Jesus' day, the, sh the shepherds would lead their flocks of sheep and they would go up onto the hills and all these sheep would mingle together. And the shepherd would turn around and all the sheep were all confused together and the shepherd would simply turn around and he would call. And the sheep would recognise their shepherd's voice. And the flocks would all split up. And the, shepherd, the sheep that belonged to a particular shepherd would follow because they knew his voice. And that's something unique within sheep. They have this ability to recognise the voice of their shepherd. A wonderful picture of how God desires to lead and to guide us. And you know, friends, he's often speaking... And we're often not listening. Who thinks that sometimes? Who remembers these things? <laughs> this, this is my brother's. My brother likes old things. When, when would this have been made, David? 1950. Who remembers this? Who's old enough to remember this? Who doesn't have a clue what I've got in my hand? Okay. <laughs> Tony, you're a liar. <sighs> Remember this? Remember being able to do that? You had one of those in your bed at night. We'd listen with headphones on. We don't use them anymore because we have mobile phones that are better and they're more accurate. And 
But you know, one of the reasons this thing works is because there's across this room this morning are radio waves that are passing through this room. You can't see them and you need a receiver to receive them. And those radio waves are here. Television waves are running through. There's there's phone conversations floating through this room. You can't see them unless you have a receiver. And I believe God wants us to work out how to be better receivers of his voice. He's speaking, but we're often not listening. Or often our receivers are tuned into the wrong frequency. You know, we need to be tuned into God. And I want to look back at the story for a few minutes. But just as God called this young man, a little boy, and he said, Samuel, Samuel. It's true that God knows your name. Did you know he knows your name, Anne? I remember a story of sheep and Anne. I'll tell a story about... (laughs) When I first met Anne, she came to live in a... We had a a house down in Bangholm. And we had two sheep. And one of these sheep, it was named... um, Bar Ram you, was it? But it fell in love with Anne. And it would look into the windows looking for her. And as soon as it see her, it would jump up on the window so it could look for Anne. It was you. It was you. And this sheep would walk around the house looking for Anne. And as soon as it would get up on the windows and look. And, for Anne. and so you were its shepherd. You, did, you weren't... The poor thing. <laughs> you weren't a very good shepherd, Anne. I'm sorry. <laughs> Get back on story. Move away from you. You know, God knows your name. And when he calls Sharon, you know he's talking to you. Who knows when God speaks... He calls you by name and it's such an empirical fact that whenever God calls to you, he doesn't go, hey, you. He goes, hey, whatever your name is, because he knows you by name. You know, names are such powerful things and there's no accident in your name. You know, in my, when I was a kid, my, my parents named me Mark Julian Whitby. And when I was a kid at school, I could never get why they gave me a girl's name, you know, because I thought Julian. But I kind of like it now, but I didn't like it when I was little. But, you know, I found out when I became a Christian that my name Mark means warrior. And I thought, you know, there's no accident in that name. And this morning, whatever your name is, it's a name that was given by God. It's a name that means something to him because you are his son or daughter. And I believe God, when he speaks to you, will call you by name. But often he'll call you in a a quiet, in a measured tone, in a way that's that's gentle. And it'll be like, Anne, Anne, who's heard the voice of God? Just call your name. It's wonderful, isn't it? He just calls you by name. And he goes, Anne, Judith. I know my wife's, my wife's real name is Suzanne. God calls her Suzanne. People call her Sue here, but he calls her Suzanne because that is the name she has. You know, friends, we need to learn to, to develop a quiet spirit. You know, one of the things that I, I struggle with when I go to visit people is they have televisions and radios on all the time. You know, they walk into their house and there's never any quiet. And it's very hard to hear God in the midst of a din that's going on. And God's often trying to shout over the top of all the things that we're hearing in our life. And if you want to hear the voice of God, you've got to still your spirit before him. As a believer, you need to learn to be still, to spend time in his presence. Friends, we need to learn not to be emotional about our relationship with God. But often he will simply come and he'll say something like, "Um, trust me, it's going to be okay. Or, hey, just be still. 
In my life, he often uses scripture to speak to me. I often will be praying or I'll be sitting in the presence of God and I'll get a direction from God simply. It's a word that gives me peace to know that he's at work. Often he'll say to me, you know, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. That's taken out of Psalm 37. And whenever God says that to me, I know he's speaking to me to, hey, I'm leading the steps here. Whenever I hear that, I know, hey, just keep on walking because the thing that you're about to walk into is actually my plan for your life. And I've learnt by, by doing it for many years that when God speaks to me, he does it in such a way that it's so right. You know, when he's guiding my strip steps, I simply need to trust him. In Proverbs chapter 3, it says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not. And lean not. And often God will say to me, Mark, lean not. And that simply means, hey, stop trusting in your mind. Stop trying to work this out because I've got it all sorted. Hey, that's a cool thing. That's a good promise right there. Or in all your ways, acknowledge me and I will direct your paths. You know, God never speaks too much. Rarely he has conversations with, with us. He rarely comes and gives us long so soliloquies. He, he, he very rarely comes and talks these big paragraphs to us. And I, I meet some people and they tell me, you know, God told me this and that. And I look at them and I think, no, he didn't. <laughs> because that's not how he is. You know why I believe that? Because God wants us to walk by faith. You know, if he makes, you get all these promises and you get all your feelings mixed up in that, it can actually take you off course. You know, when you're wise in God and you learn to grow, and that's what he's trying to teach you. Faith is the, is the essence of things hoped for. God, what is the next step? I want you to trust me. God, where do I go now? Don't, don't worry, I have it all sorted. But God, I need you to tell me. Trust in me with all of your heart. Lean not, oh God. You know, without faith, the Bible said, it is impossible to please God. And the whole measure of our walk down here is a measure where God is trying to teach us to live by faith in him and his promises. And if God spoke too much into your life, it would actually undervalue or undermine the very development of that faith. Because you'd start to learn to think, well, God's just going to tell me, I'll just keep doing that. But as you walk by faith, you're stepping through the promises. And sometimes you've got to step around things because God is leading you in the midst of your life. He wants you to grow up and you're growing muscles Faith muscles. Who's got really big faith muscles here this morning? Who'd like some stronger faith muscles? You know, when Peter stepped out of the boat, and we know the scripture, and I won't labour it this morning, but the, he simply heard the Lord, and he was walking across the water, and he said, if it's you, God, bid me to come. And Jesus simply said the word, come. Peter said, okay, got out of the boat. And he stood upon the water only momentarily. But that word was enough to sustain him in the midst of the water which was totally inadequate to hold him. It was not the water that held him, but it was the word of the living God. And friends, God is wanting to teach us when he says it, he means it. When God plants it in your spirit, he wants you to trust it with all of your heart. Because he's teaching you to be a son or a daughter of faith. And he wants us to learn to listen. You know, sometimes he'll, he'll lead us by impressions or by convictions. I used to have this guy that I knew. I'd ask him to do things and he'd say, I prayed about it. And God said no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we got to the point. We'd say, don't ask him because God will say no. You 
You know, can I encourage you when you get prophetic words from other people, don't step out on those prophetic words until you check whether you're really hearing God correctly. Because the prophetic is a significant thing. And I believe we're moving into a time where the prophetic realm is going to open up like never before. But we need to learn how to base our walk on faith and not about someone saying something pleasant over your life. You know, the prophetic is the only gift in the New Testament that is we are called to check whether it is right or wrong. In the book of 1 Corinthians, it actually says two or three prophets should speak and the others should weigh carefully what is said. Can I encourage you? Don't get trapped in this prophetic thing where prophecy becomes just amazing. And I love prophecy. Don't get me wrong. I just love it. But it's called to be weighed. Is this God? Is this right? Do you feel this fits for me? You know, it may sound impressive, but it could also be wrong. I've had some really wrong words over the years. I've had people prophesy me into things and away from things. And I think I told you a story of a guy in our church once that prophesied the pastor out and another pastor in, in the middle of the service, you know. He was wrong. But he learned some things afterwards because we needed to talk to him. And, you know, one of the good things about that is he submitted. He came to the office. We sat with him and said, what you did was wrong. This has caused confusion in the body. You need to apologise. He got up and he apologised to the church. And You know, friends, as Pentecostals, sometimes we've got a, a pretty bad track record with some of this stuff and some of the hocus pocus that goes on with, with, uh, with prophecy and stuff. We've got to be really careful. I remember years ago, I was talking to a pastor, one of the older pastors in the city, and he told me he had this pastor, this new pastor, turn up into the city. And he said, he came and saw me and he said, brother, my name is so-and-so and I'm going to have the biggest church in Frankston. He goes, oh, hello. <laughs> All humble and everything. And this biggest church of Frankston lasted five years and the guy was gone. And the problem is often we think we hear God and he promises something and then a little bit later we think he's changed his mind. Well, I want to tell you that God doesn't change his mind like that. That is the way we interpret things. And we've got to learn to walk by faith. I remember when I planted this ministry, this, this you know, feeding ministry, and I remember say, having this conversation with God. You know, God, people have done this stuff so badly. And he said, yes, I know. That's why I want you to do it well. And so I've, I fed the God, okay, I'm going to plant this thing and I'm not going to stop it until you tell me to stop it or I die first. And, you know, that's why we've been doing what we do for so long. We keep doing it because God doesn't change his mind. He's not arbitrary like us. He, we get up in the morning, well, I don't feel like it today. <laughs> yeah, but God hasn't changed. You know, God often... Um, tells people to marry people. Not. <laughs> Over the years, I've met people that have come and they said, oh, God's told me to marry this person. I go, yeah, has he? Because <laughs> often we get our emotions involved in this whole debate about marriage. And I want to say to you, God delights when you fall in love. You meet someone and you get attracted to them and you enjoy their presence and you go off and do it that way. And you get it where people get prophesied into marriages or they hear God say, go and marry that certain person. And I've seen those marriages become awful because it wasn't God. It was an emotional response. You know, friends, we need to learn to listen and we need to learn to admit when we've made a mistake. I remember Sean Boltz told a story about, and he was a young guy who was not married in the church. He, he, ha, he used to have all these women trying to marry him, you know. And this particular woman turned up at church with a wedding dress on one day. Because <laughs> he'd heard, heard God tell her that he was going to be, you know, like, like he, he, you know, I don't know what he did, but... <laughs> But trust me, he didn't marry her. And then another time he had, a, had a, um, a wedding place ring him up and said, hey, listen, um, your, your suit's ready for your wedding. And he said, sorry. 
and oh, you've got to pay for your wife's wedding. Another woman who heard God said, well, you just have to step out and take it by faith, you know, walk in the spirit, brother, you know. And, and so he's had these experiences and, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Who's ever made a mistake in God? <laughs> Can I suggest admitting it? Hey, hey, I was wrong. <laughs> that was really dumb. I've heard God tell me stuff and I've stepped out it and I found myself out here and God's back there and I'm thinking, oops. <laughs> no, well, back to where he back to where he stopped talking to me. Because I stepped out on a, a word of presumption. And sometimes, friend, listening to God is an art to where we must learn to listen to his voice. And if he says, trust me, don't do anything. Just trust him. He's gonna do it. And the problem with most of us is we try to work it out. You know, I, I, all the mistakes I've made is when my emotions get involved. You know, back to our story in verse 18, it says, So Samuel told everything, told Eli everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And you know, friends, one of these, and I don't want to overcook this, but one of the things that we need to learn to do is walk in relationship. Bring these things to those you trust and listen to their counsel. If you, if you hear God saying something and you're, you set off without checking it out with people you trust in, you are asking for problems. You know, one of the reasons the Bible talks about we are the body of Christ. The body needs each other. A hand cannot function without an arm. An arm cannot function without a torso. And friends, we all need to belong together. Not each one of us having individual ideas, but each one of us fitting together. That's what the Word of God tells us. You know, I don't believe in lording it over people. I don't believe that, you know, that my, my role is to tell people what to do. I believe my role is to help people to hear God for themselves. And when they get it wrong, help them to see where they got it wrong so they can hear God right. Because control never works either. If you tell people, well, God's telling you to do this. Well, that's just, that's just manipulation. That's not the spirit of God at all. You know, churches that make you bring everything to the leaders are, are just dangerous. I, you know, I, if you get into church like that, can I suggest you don't <laughs> get out of it? Because it's not going to be healthy. It, it won't bear good fruit. Relationship and trust. You know, people who don't like your advice and won't listen, Often it's independence. And I've learned over the years of doing what I do that people who have an independent spirit, they don't like what you say, so they leave. And they go to another place until he says or she says something they don't like and then they leave again. Friends, submission is such a big part of being a Christian. And I'm not talking about, oh, you've got to join a church. I'm saying you need to walk in submission. Learning to be a person of submission you know, um, sheep that don't stay, sheep that don't stay in sheepfolds often end up getting into error or led astray. And it's interesting to me, and I'm, I'm nearly done here, but I, that Jesus made many warnings about this. In 2 Timothy, he said, The time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. In fact, it says in the King James, they will heap up teachers for themselves. They will look for people that agree with them in their error. And friends, we are living in a time that Jesus prophesied about, a time where deception would come. And, you know, I, I read this week about a, a guy, a young guy that used to be attached to the Bethel group and he was an amazing young guy moving in the supernatural. Now he, he actually teaches that we are reincarnated beings and we actually come from another planet because he's allowed error into his heart. 
And friends, these things, just because someone is moving in a supernatural manifestation does not mean it is from the Spirit of the living God. We need to recognise these things. Jesus said many will come to deceive. In fact, I have done a study on, on, um, on deception. It's, um, you know, I'm writing a, a book on it and I've done, it's amazing. The amount of times that Jesus spoke about deception is actually more than anything else. The, the New Testament speaks about deception in ways that you don't even understand. And one of the th reasons that people end up in deception is they disconnect from the body and they go off and do independent things. And it opens you up to many of these things. And Second Timothy says, but, but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You know, Jesus warned that false prophets will come that will even deceive the elect. Friends, that's the sons of the kingdom. I mean, that's nuts. But when you are a, a son of God, we need to stay connected to someone. We need to be in submission to someone. We need to hear the voice of other people around about us saying, Hey, I'm not sure that's right. And if you don't agree with them, then you need to check, is this, is this an area of, of pride in my heart? You know, one of the ways that I've seen people get deceived is allowing pride, that they have a special revelation. And pride is the very sin that caused the first fall in the first place. Friends, just keep a check on your hearts. I'm not trying to lay a trip, but I just feel like God is wanting us to be aware we're moving in to some amazing times. But the enemy will come in like a flood. One of the ways I believe that God will increasingly lead us, increasingly lead us is by dreams and visions. You know, um, Peter had a vision of animals that were unclean. You know the story in the book of Acts and the vision. He, he was told to rise and eat. And he said, surely not, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. But God was actually using this dream or this vision. It was, it was asleep, so it was a, a dream, but it was also a vision within a dream to break a religious value of his life. He was to go to the Gentiles, something that he would not have been willing to do. And so the Lord was using this situation to challenge this young man's value system. And he used a dream or he used a vision to do that. You know, Joseph actually received a number of dreams from God about Jesus. He considered divorcing Mary when she was told him she was pregnant. And then he had a dream and the, and the angel Gabriel appeared to him in a dream and it said, the child within her is from the seed of God. I want you to marry her. Now, if you had a dream like that, I think you might listen. <sighs> but that was a dream. For Joseph, another time he was told in a dream that they would come and try to kill Jesus and he was to go into Egypt. And often we discount our dreams. We think, well, you know, that was just pizza. But God is trying to speak to us. I know last week you had a dream interpretation thing went on here. Apparently it went really well and, well, a couple of weeks ago. And, I, you know, I do believe in this generation there are people that need to hear this way. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, it says prophetically there would be a way that God would speak to his children. It says, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your young men will, will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And uh, I do believe this is part of the generation that's alive today. And I believe this type of revelation will increase. Friends, keep a pad beside your bed. Keep something there where when you get something from God, write it down. And then say later to the Lord, hey God, what does this mean? And he'll give you an understanding. Ask God to decipher them. If you're unsure, talk to those people you trust. Submit them to others in authority and God will bless you. Sometimes, friends, God will use other people to speak to you and their words will be like fire in your heart. Who's ever been in a situation where someone has said something and that word has just gone, whoa, just spoken to me. And that's like a reamer from the Spirit of God and God will use other people to do that. Sometimes it might be a sermon or it might be just a word that someone's using. But it's something that God will use. It could be a message or a conversation. 
Another way God can guide us is in circumstance. And that's like the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. And often we find God will use several ways in which to say the same thing. The Bible says by the mouth of two or three witnesses, a thing is confirmed. And if God is saying something to you, you might get a prophetic word, but you can expect that to be confirmed. You can expect something else to happen that God will speak to you. You know what he's doing? He's training you to walk by faith. Remember, God will always lead by peace. You know, if you feel turmoil, or if you feel confused or upset or anxious, that's never the Spirit of God. His ways are always peace. The Bible says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, let your requests be known unto God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And that's the power of the gospel, friends. Finally, this morning, I just, I, 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 I felt the Lord just drop this into my heart as I was, I wasn't going to share it. But I felt him say, you know, Eli was a prophet of the Lord and he had, had these two sons. Their name was Hopni and Phinehas and and it's interesting, if you, if you read through the scriptures, you'll find Eli doesn't play a big role. And his two sons were corrupt. They were actually corrupt young men. And they offered strange fire in the temple of the Lord. They actually would go and steal meat out of the, out of the servants, out of the meat that had been given to the priests. It was a, they were dreadful young men. And finally, God killed them. And, and they offered this, this strange fire, but it represented something of an old order. And I felt the Lord say to me this, this morning as I was thinking about this, that Samuel represents a new way. He was a son of Eli, but he wasn't a son of his flesh. He carried the mantle that Eli had, but he carried it in a new way. And I felt God say to me that there's a generation arising today that will serve the Lord faithfully, that will carry the mantle, that will carry the prophetic mantle in a way that can be trustworthy and true. You know, Samuel served the Lord all his life. As a young man, he was set apart and he walked in significant authority. And God used him in the most profound ways. And today, friends, God is looking for those who long to be faithful, to be a generation that is set apart. You know, as I shared with the young guys, the young people in, Th in Thailand as we graduated the students, such a burden to see those kids carry a mantle that their nation doesn't know anything about. A mantle that is going to supernaturally change their nation. You know, a prophetic generation that walks in the ways of God. Did you know the more he can trust us, the more he will give us. But he's, he's trying to teach you to be trustworthy. And the way we become trustworthy is we hear the word of God and we obey it. We listen and we take small steps and faithful, faithfully he'll grow us. And friends, today as I finish, I really want you to make a decision, a decision that I really desire to hear his voice. You know, just like Samuel, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Close your eyes. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Is that your prayer? Is that what you want? This morning as you as you just think about what I've shared, are you open to that? Are you open to the realm of God? Are you listening to the Spirit of God or are you doing your own thing? The reason I felt to bring this word, I, I feel God just said to me, this is the word I want you to bring this morning. As I said, it wasn't something I was choosing to bring, but I feel that some of you this morning needed to hear this. And so, if you're in this house today and you know, hey, I haven't been listening. I haven't been tuning my heart. I've been doing my own thing. This is the day that I want you to make a decision to say, just like Samuel, hey, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. 
Why don't you pray in your spirit right now? If that's you, I'm not going to call you out. But I do believe God wants to speak to some of you. He wants to show you a, bit, a better way. You know, I feel like the Lord's just shown me there's some people here this morning and you've allowed fear to control you. You've allowed things to stop you and you know you've been doing things that God doesn't want you to do, but you've done it because of fear. You've, you've done it because of fear of what people will think of you. You've, been, you've done it because fear that he won't provide for you. You've done it because fear that God is not who he says he is. Now, if that's you this morning, I'm speaking to you for a moment. I do believe that God is trying to wrestle with some hearts here today. Wrestle with some hearts in the house. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Oh, God. I'm just going to, I'm not going to invite you forward, but if that's you, I want you to stand where you are. If you feel like, hey, you know, that's me. I, I do need to put some things right here. I'm just going to invite you to stand. I think there needs to be a couple of people that, that are going to respond to that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, that's right. That's right. I'm going to pray for those ones standing. Hallelujah. Now, if you're in a good place with God and you know you're strong, you know where you are, can I encourage you to come and lay hands on those people that are standing up? Because some of the leaders could come and gather, please. Just come and gather with those ones. Father, I just uh, speak over these lives that are standing this morning. You know what's going on in their journey. They've allowed um, decisions to be made that are, that are not based in faith. They've allowed things to happen that are not where they should be. And today, Lord, I break the work of the enemy. I break the work of the flesh in Jesus' name. And I pray, Lord, for a revelation of the voice of God over some people here today. A revelation of freedom, a revelation this Christmas time that these ones are going to be broken free into a new place of hearing the voice of God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you go and find someone and give them a, a high five or a hug. Ask them first if it's okay to hug them, please. Just, just let us think first. Thank you, Lord. Anne's going to come and read her poem to us just as we finish this morning. Thanks, Anne. She's just written this. Okay. Oh my gosh. Can you hear the gentle? I love you. Do you love me? I gave my life for you. Would you give your life to me? I call you my son, my daughter, my own. Will you call me father? Draw close to me and I'll draw close to you. I am but a heartbeat away, just a breath so close you don't realize. Close your eyes and breathe me in and feel my presence close to you. For I am rest and peace for your troubled souls. I am your friend, your ever, I am your friend forever, your king forevermore. Please come and rest a while in my arms of love and I will show you my glory. Amen. 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 We're going to sing, sing this new song, sing this Sue's written, I think. It'll be good. Why don't we all come out? Why don't you get out of your seat? Come on up at the front. The presence of God's up here, and we're going to sing this together. Put your arm around someone, and let's do a big thing. Hold on to someone. You don't have to do that, but I, you know, let's get all let's get all family for a minute. It's Christmas. People need to feel embraced at Christmas. Come on. Great. 